now we have time for questions. We have our mic guy just grabbing the mic there, and you know by now taking your that's nice with some background that's great guitar music. Playing. Yeah, we oh, can learn how to do more things at once. We'll uh, have unicycles in the back if you want to practice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so wave your hand and your name. We have, a, we have a volunteer over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Johan Lang. Um, I have a question for Sarah. Uh, you said something that um, stupid guys do better with feedback. Um, could there be a system problem that I keep them back in the um, feeling of being stupid by giving feedback instead of, for instance, coaching? Well, the idea is that um, you continuously update your anticipations. Um, and when you have enough evidence, when you find you have enough evidence, you will update your anticipation. And in this case, it would actually be the opposite, that uh, you start doing much better when you get feedback and you realize that mm, I'm not doing that badly. Um, so it could be, I would guess that the effect would be that you actually become more confident. Um. One, of, one of the things I did um, in writing the book Guitar Zero was I went to classes for different people learning guitar. I mean, I went some for myself, but I also went for young children, um, including kids who were taking Suzuki lessons for guitar who were like uh, three or four years old. And one of the teachers there was really great. And what she said to the parents was, never ever correct your child unless they've made the same mistake at least three times. And part of why she was saying that is there's feedback about what you're doing, whether it's right or wrong, but there's also feedback in order to encourage someone, to motivate them. And so some of the work that Sarah was talking about, about um, flow states, for example, the video games are designed to give you a certain amount of negative feedback, but more positive feedback than, than negative feedback to keep you going. So I think there's an element of feedback that's about motivation, there's an element that's about information, and you want to balance those in some yeah, way. Exactly. Thank you. And do we have uh, any more questions? We have one there, and then we have... Yeah, I have a question for Sarah. How much uh, of the priming is linked to belief? If you s I mean, if the subject is primed, as being uh, stupid, and the, the subject doesn't believe it, or uh, vice versa. Yes, so um, we always ask the participants after the experiment to fill in a questionnaire. So, so first of all, when I, uh, I hope this answers your question, when I in, uh, instruct the participants, I say that you will first do a language task and then a working memory task. I never tell them that they are going to be primed. Afterwards, I ask them, did you f they fill in a questionnaire answering the question, do you think there was any link between the two tasks you did? Do you think one of the tasks influenced the other? And the interesting thing is that in 95% of the cases, people don't understand that there is a link. And that's why it's, I mean, these are really automatic, implicit processes. Um, the second thing with my studies is that the same participants are primed both with being clever and stupid. And the fact that I see the strongest effect only when they make errors and not so much when they make correct responses also implies that they are not really aware, <laughs> but it's rather like an automatic, quite dynamic process. There are studies suggesting that would they be aware, they could actually um, counteract and not get so influenced by it. Um, but of obviously, in order to be able to be primed stupid, you have to have a representation of stupid, so you have to have a feeling of how it is to be stupid. Uh, you have to have that schema, so to speak. Do you want to add to that? Thank you. And we had a question. Yes, I have a question here. Uh, my name is Tina Marie Whitman, and I have a question um, also for Sarah, but for, for both of you, uh, really. Um, have you found that there are differences um, between image or language-based sources for priming? Uh, for example, if you would see a picture of a, of a crying face versus the word cry, do you, do you find that there are different results, or, or what, what are the differences? Uh, I haven't studied that, but I'm sure you know much better, 
the difference between language and I mean, there, there's, it's not quite my area of expertise, but there, there are certainly studies that have looked at, for example, bilinguals and can you be primed from either language. Um, there's, there's evidence that you can be primed from your secondary language, that you can be primed uh, from visual materials. Um, there's certainly many different ways in which one can be primed. And then um, there's arguments about how strong the effects are, how fragile their effects are, when you get them, when you don't. But certainly, almost anything you can think of, there's at least some evidence that some priming some of the time. Thank you. And we have another question here. Hello, my name is Aista, and um, this question for Gary, but really both. Um, I know there, there are windows, especially for language, and if you miss that window, like uh, the feral child, Jeannie, uh, she never really learned language after that, the way we, she, she spoke, but the way we, the regular speakers, she didn't. Has there been any studies or anything else like language that um, we cannot learn as well, there's would. a couple of things I would say there. The, the first is that in Jeannie's case, she was locked in a closet till she was about 11, I think. And so there were profound social effects as well as linguistic effects. So um, from a scientific perspective, she's not a very clean case. You don't really know whether the problems she had were because she didn't want to interact with other people or because she had problems, say, with a language acquisition device like Chomsky might talk about. Um, and that's generally a problem with all of the feral children. The best studies maybe are ones of kids that are taught in oral schools, t deaf children that are taught spoken languages. Um, Alyssa Newport has, has done some of that work. And I think that the evidence shows that there's some effect, but it's not nearly as strong as people think. So I wouldn't want to say adults can't learn new languages. I would say that on average they don't do it as well. People have done much larger scale studies, and what you see is a kind of gradual fall off. So the, the way it's written up in the literature is sort of you reach puberty and you're done. You can't learn anymore. I always imagine it as you start thinking about sex and you can't learn another language. But the empirical data are some people past that point, and as adults learn second languages natively. Not most people, most people can't, but some people can. Um, and the, the, the decline is pretty gradual. If you actually look at the graphs carefully in this classic work by Alyssa Newport, the difference in percent correct is like between 100% and 80% correct, or something like that, or 75% correct. Um, and on some things, on word order, the, the non-native adult learning speakers do pretty well. There, there are subtle things that have to do with accent, basically. Those are the hardest ones. Um, one other thing that's really pretty hard for adults to learn about is perfect pitch. So it seems like if you're learning perfect pitch, you have to do that early in life. But almost anything else that I can think of offhand that isn't like directly perceptual, I would not write the adults off. I would say that you know until we do careful data, and there are lots of things where if you actually do a carefully controlled experiment, in fact, most things, the adults will learn something faster than the youngest children. If you look in any article that you pick at random from a developmental psychology journal that looks at kids of different ages up to adult controls, the adults will learn whatever is going on faster than the, than the say, the 10-year-olds, and 10-year-olds will learn it faster than the five-year-olds, and the five-year-olds will learn it faster than the two-year-olds. And so it's hard to find laboratory evidence. One possibility is kids just don't quit. They get into something and they keep going at it. The way I think about it is imagine your young child watching the same DVD over and over and over again. There's a kind of patience that young kids have. Maybe that's part of what's going on. It's not that they're faster at learning things, but they stick to it longer. That could be explaining a lot of the obvious fact that people who learn languages younger in life learn them better. Mm -hmm. But if you try to kind of narrow this down in the lab, it's hard to find things that little kids are actually better at than adults. Thank you. And have you seen, uh, have you tried with different ages in your lab? No, that's a very good point. I have not. So adults in the lab? My participants are between 18 and 35 years mm. old. There, there are some studies in the last few years showing that priming is something that kids are subject to. Um, they, there's some argument that they're more weakly subject to it. So you can think like the classic prime is, I say the word doctor and you start to hear the word nurse. Well, if you're four years old, you don't have as strong an association in your head between doctor and nurse, but you still might get some small priming there. And then as you get older and the concepts become more associated, you get a stronger prime. Mm. Thank you. And we have a next question here. Hi, and thank you for interesting um, speech. I'm Camilla, and uh, I'm interested in, in cultural uh, and organizational development. And I wonder how can we create culture in organizations and in schools to support more learning? Good question. And the first thing I think of is the Claude Steele stuff. Do you want to talk about that? But 
Yeah, I could. Actually, I'm quite fascinated by um, Carol Dweck's studies that I have mm. read. Um, there are studies suggesting that um, instead of giving feedback to children that, oh, you are clever, you, uh, you should feedback what they do. You did a clever thing. So uh, you should focus on what they do. So this notion, what I spoke about, of task focus rather than me focus. So that's one thing. Um, and I would also promote, even though I haven't scientific evidence, that, uh, I mean, what, what my studies clearly shows is that one day you can feel clever, but the next day the same person can feel stupid. And as I said, it seems as if when you feel stupid, you are more uncertain and you benefit m more from feedback. So if you learn to know yourself uh, and are allowed to put yourself in different uh, environments in school, so maybe today I need feedback, next day I need peace and quiet. I, I don't know the empirical literature for this well, but I would say that kids are born really interested in learning. It's a natural part of their culture. Um, if they don't learn enough things per moment, then they start to fuss. Um, and so you bring them into school, at least in my country, and there's kind of a culture not of learning so much as a culture of obedience, of, of following the rules, maybe learning particular tests. And I think that that diminishes what's an intrinsic culture, or at least an intrinsic drive towards learning. Um, that relates to some of the stuff that you, you started with. I, so I think that we are naturally, as a species, really, really curious. Um, and then it's not that we need to instill that, it's that we need to figure out how to make it stop going away. And uh, uh, I'm going to see if there is, do we have more question here? Because a follow-up question before, when you think about you have a question is, uh, you talked, uh, well, you talked about how if we know how to learn, then we can learn. And on to both of you, but to be able to learn, we also need some times to unlearn. And so how do we unlearn? I mean, unlearning is a really hard thing. So um, unlearning is about breaking habits. And the, the default for the brain is the more often you do something, the more the brain makes that automatic and does it more quickly. So. Um, one of the reasons you need, for example, a teacher when you're playing guitar is if you teach yourself how to play guitar, you get in bad habits about posture. And then as you do the same thing over and over again, as long as you're making reasonably good music, but maybe not great music, your brain says, hey, I'm doing great here. And then it just gets better and better at doing that thing, even if it's not quite the wrong thing. So, and the best thing to do with habits is to not develop them in the first place, is to have mm -hmm. teachers that monitor you and say, no, this is not a good idea. Once you start on a habit like smoking, it's pretty hard for, for the human brain to get over it. We may start to develop better chemical interventions and so forth, but um, our natural tendency is to do whatever we do, just do it faster and faster and, and, and more efficiently. Part of the reason I think the brain does it is it takes less attention. So if you do the same thing over and over, then it takes less attention. That leaves more room for you to do other things. So you start driving. First, it's really hard to figure out how to take a turn and put on the turn signal. It becomes automatic. Then you have more room for conversation. And unfortunately, you have room for your cell phone. Um, so the brain doesn't always put this extra space to good use, but the natural thing is to make things automatic to take less attention. And that's, that's where habits come from. Uh, I, mean, I could add that if you think about Pavlov's dogs that I spoke about, that is pretty much the idea behind uh, cognitive therapy. So if you, ha if you have made an association one point in your life that uh, you're afraid of elevate lifts, you got stuck in a lift, in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, what you do is to be exposed to lifts in a pleasant state and in a pleasant environment to change this, to unlearn the phobia and to, to make positive associations between lift and the second item. There's so some one treatments of of, sort of along those lines. There's some experimental treatments of PTSD. They're not uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't think that they're clinically ready yet, but they will try to activate a memory that's bad in a way that memory is, is a habit, it's a kind of habit, and then deliver a chemical at just the right moment that's involved in the brain's process of reconsolidating something. So ordinarily, I guess another reason that a habit continues is you do it and the brain tries to make that even more firm. So if there's some way of interrupting the process of consolidation, then we might be able to pharmaceutically um, break habits in that way. Is there, do we have, we have one question here? 
Okay, thank you both guys for excellent uh, speeches. Uh, I have one question, I think it's for both of you, but perhaps you could start, Gary. Um, it's about how those of us who work with teaching, um, how can we, what, what is the key in order to kind of lower, to, to lower the barrier, entry barrier for learning something new. So I'm, I'm thinking you, you had an example with the 3,000 hours versus 23,000 mm -hmm. hours of learning chess. So what, what, what are, are the key elements in order to learn something faster, to, uh, to come in, in, in the state of flow as you also described, uh, Sarah? There are probably many, but I would start with motivation and teaching. So one of the things that you want to do is to make your practice regimes effective by making them not be too tedious, such that you're not really fully engaged. So we talked about flow um, earlier. You want to be kind of in a flow state when you're practicing. You want to enjoy yourself. If you find that something's tedious, for example, you might want to change your practice regime. So for example, if you're always working with a metronome, and that gets boring, to use the music example again, maybe work with a drum machine sometimes so that you're varying the practice, you're keeping yourself in a flow state. The other thing I would emphasize as a teacher, you don't typically know the outcome that you're trying to achieve. You don't really know what it's like to be skilled at something. And so you're kind of figuring it out for yourself. Maybe you're watching some YouTube videos. But a teacher is going to be able to monitor what you do and recognize, a good teacher is going to be able to recognize that, hey, this step you're doing is ultimately going to lead to something wrong. So to continue the guitar example, if you start playing guitar and you don't use your pinky, you'll get a long way, your, your little finger. You, you get a long way, but then you'll reach an end point where you really can't ha have long enough reaches for th things and so forth. A good teacher will not just pay attention, hey, he's playing the notes in the right order, but watch you closely and say, hey, he's not using his little finger. That's going to lead to problems down the road. You're not going to know that for yourself. And this is why teachers are valuable, is that they, if, if they're sensitive, if they're like a good car mechanic who's looking at, hey, what's going wrong here, and they can be gentle and deliver the feedback in the right way, then they can alert you to problems that you don't even realize are problems. So those are the two things that I would emphasize most, although I think there are a lot, but would be having the right kind of teacher who really studies the art of learning this particular skill and making sure that you keep yourself engaged, that practice doesn't feel like labor, but it's somehow fun. Do you yeah, want to add, Sarah? Just very, uh, a very small thing. Um, so the brain is very clever. The brain will compute how much effort do I have to put in and what do I get back, right? So it's important uh, to understand the reward to understand, or, and or, or more likely to want a reward. You know, the student needs to want what it gets, otherwise it's too effortful for the brain. It so the some, some kind of understanding of the goal. Or the you, you mentioned your teacher, I guess, or you imply your teacher. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is that students learn the best if they realize that they actually don't understand something. So a good good trick is to find like if you're teaching them fractions, find some fraction problem that they don't understand and then walk them through it so that they do understand it. People, especially young children, overestimate how much they do know, but even undergraduates, college students underestimate how much they do know. And it, it's very easy for someone to slide through a lecture not thinking about what they don't know, not realizing that there's something there to learn. So if you can gently point out a fallacy in people's thinking, such that they're aware that there is something to learn, that increases their motivation in itself. So that's another thing to think about. Thank you. And it was, and we had a question in the back here as well. Oh, but you can take the mic because we're streaming as well, so then we catch it. For, for the benefit of the people on the internet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wonder, uh, learning a skill where you know the answer is something uh, we know of from school, but many of us try to actually get teams into taking risks mm -hmm. to be innovative and creative. So can you learn to take more risks and be creative without knowing that you get the reward? Is that a too tricky question? Do you, do you know where I'm heading? I can try it if you want. Um, <laughs> try. Em the emphasis risk. on the word try. <laughs> I, I think that to some extent, risk taking is a genetic thing. So some people are genetically inclined to take more risks than others. And you can see this very, very early in life. 
Um, but I think you can also, if you're teaching a class of soccer kids or some, foot, I guess you guys call it football, um, I think that you can try to calibrate the rewards to whether the kids take risks and they, w they will pick up on that. So um, if you say, you know, great shot, even if the child missed the goal, um, but you still reward the behavior that, that, um, that they were intending, I think that, you know, that's going to lead in one direction as opposed to if you only reward them when they get a goal, and you say, oh, that's great, they got the goal. And so I think that, that young children are very sensitive, and adults are very sensitive to what the rewards are. And if you think carefully about whether you're rewarding people for success as opposed to sort of doing the right kinds of behaviors, that's one way to, to mediate the risk-taking ability. Encourage people to take the risks. And with, with the link to what you said, uh, with the risk, if you uh, consider yourself smart, you're more uh, inclined to not take risk. Is there a link to it? Um, mm, I didn't mention anything about that, but uh, what signifies uh, a negative self-image is not having thoughts that, oh, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. It's actually consistently a consistent finding is that you just display uncertain behavior. So it's uncertain, it's a lot of variance in the data and so on. And of course, um, and I showed you also that you activate areas in the brain related to pain and aversion and loss and so on. So of course, if you have a positive self-image, you're m probably more likely to explore and be brave because you feel calmer and less stressed. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And we have room for one more question. Take a risk, somebody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be creative. We learned about risk. So we're, but, but I asked, so what's the, what's the biggest, because we're talking about li uh, power and lies and disruption. So what's the biggest lie about learning that we need to know or what you talk about and what's, what should we do with the power of learning? I mean, I think the biggest lie is that it, <laughs> I think the biggest lie is that you can't do it if you're an adult. And I think the biggest disruption is if there's something that you want to learn, you think I'm too old to do this. Go ahead and do it. So there, there are these studies on eudaimonia, which is um, goes back to Aristotle. There's two kinds of pleasure in life. There's the immediate uh, gratification of food and sex and so forth, um, immediate pleasure. But there's the long-term pleasure of fulfilling your potential. So disrupt that feeling that says, I can't do this. Pick something that you love that you think you're never going to be great at, but it would be fun just to do it. That's what happened with guitar. I'm not Jimi Hendrix, but I love just to be able to play. Find your guitar. Go out there and learn it. Thank you. And Sara? No, no, I don't have any. I mean, it's really Gary's to topic. Um, I'm just fascinated by all the years I've been doing my research. I put people in the MR scanner, which is very noisy, quite boring, actually. And I, and I have these awfully boring tasks because we need to sample a lot of data points. And I'm so fascinated by how intrinsically motivated people are. They want to do well, even though it's very boring. And uh, also, we have done studies where we manipulate feedback in different ways and in different aspects and uh, f factorial designs. And it turns out that most people perform best if they don't get any feedback because they are competent. The brain is competent to understand, oops, I did an error. I will try to, to correct it. So, so use our it's not really a secret or, or, or uh, something that someone would oppose, I guess. But that's my most obvious impression over the years. So the reminder that we have the power and the capacity to yes. learn. Definitely. Thank you very much for Thank you. your talk. Thank you. Thank you.